It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'm setting the context for today as regards research integrity. Now, this is an area that's becoming of great importance in the research field for institutions, but not only there, for all of you, because all your the companies you run, the, the charities you're part of, the journals that you have will all be impacted on this because many of the problems with research integrity do not come to light until that work is submitted for publication or published. I can hear, see heads nodding. You, your people, your processes are all impacted. They take time, energy, they can disrupt relationships completely. So if you can do things to help the research community bring the work forward in a way that it won't be problematical, you will that it will be a great ach achievement. So I'm hoping today to sort of draw attention to the new things because there are staggeringly new things occurring, things that shock me. And I've been in scholarly publishing for 35 years. And I, until recently, was not shocked by anything because I thought I'd seen everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, the very ugly. But now things are happening that shock me almost on a monthly basis. Um, the context I'm bringing to this is that I was a journal editor for uh, 20 years. I was with COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, on council for three years, and for the past three years I've been giving research integrity workshops at universities to PhD students and early career researchers and supervisors, although that's a, a, a different issue. So I have uh, dealt with hundreds of um, young, young early career researchers. Integrity, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Trust, honesty are absolutely central to research. We trust that what researchers are doing is honest when you su receive submissions. Is it being dented? Is it being, trust being eroded? There are many guidelines. I'm just going to skip through this just so you can see the kinds of words. They'll have words like honesty. Honesty often features at the top. Accountability, fairness. There are so many guidelines. It's does researchers absolutely no good to read them all because they don't make sense to them. They can't understand the principles. They can be overwhelming. They have worthy statements, but how do you put them into practice? And there are actually very few guidelines that tell you what you do. Things vary across disciplines. And with increasing collaborations between disciplines, between countries, we are seeing different kinds of, of problems. And I know, because one of the questions I ask when I run workshops is to a group of PhD students, and they're not necessarily the first years, how many people in this room know that you cannot submit the same manuscript to more than one journal at a time? Very few hands. Oh, I, oh I'm glad. <laughs> That's the question I asked. Did, did everyone put their hand up? <laughs> That's the question I asked you. Only a few hands go up. That is such a basic principle that everyone assumes they know, but unless the PA, their, their mentor, their trainer, tells them about that. They don't know. And I've had third, fourth year PhD students who do not know that, but that's considered publication misconduct. I always focus on the positive, building a culture of research integrity from the top down, from institutions, down through all the departments, down to the individual researchers. And I'm going to uh, represent that graphically um, at the end of the, the talk. Focus on the positive, but people have to know what research misconduct is. And what different institutions, what different countries view as misconduct varies. But there are three things that are almost universally considered to be um, publication misconduct, uh, research misconduct, fabrication, making things up. And there have been some staggering cases of that, falsification, altering things slightly, and plagiarism, which is a big one. And it's across the whole research cycle from proposing, performing, or reviewing research, or in reporting those results. It doesn't include honest error. And this is a thing we have to get across to researchers. They must not be afraid to admit to errors. They have to have a culture in their groups, into their institutions, which means they can go to their supervisors and say, I've done something. Do not bury it, because that's part of the learning process, because there are ways you can correct it from the research stage right up to the published stage with retractions, corrections, uh, whatever. But we have this whole range, not just fraud, the things that are called questionable research practices. And people are very worried about those. What effect are those having? How common are these things? Uh, most of you will probably be uh, familiar with the Finelli um, meta-analysis, systematic review of misconduct. And these are figures that come up repeatedly. So around 2% admitted to um, having done one of the things that are viewed as distorting knowledge, the, 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 the big two, fabrication, falsification. 
but it doesn't equate to retraction rate. And I know um, Chris is going to touch on that um, this afternoon. So we have things in the literature we know <coughs> is there, and I call it pollution of the literature. You know, there are things in there that people think are right and they're not. But up to a third admit to questionable research practices. That's horrendous. And I know when you look at another study, a third of researchers admit to not keeping adequate research records. These are things, some, a lot of these things are practical issues that there's no excuse for. But what is really worrying is in all these surveys, when you ask people, what about people you've seen doing these things? And the figures shoot right up. 14% have seen colleagues engage in fabrication. 72% in other questionable practices. And these are always, when people ask about their own behavior, we know they're conservative um, estimates. Are there increasing pressures on researchers? I think they are. I hear it all over the place, and you see it in surveys. Now, this is a quote from Stephen Locke uh, in the seminal book he, he wrote on peer review, 1991, but it's even more relevant today. And underlying these worries was yet another, that scientific articles have been hijacked away from their primary role of communicating scientific discovery to one of demonstrating academic activity. We know that. The UK has just been through, through the REF. Um, and I hear this from research, the pressure that's put on them. And despite the fact that impact factor of journals shouldn't have counted in the REF in the UK, it did. I was at EMBL recently, the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, a conference of 150 PhD students that they organized themselves. What were they all aiming for? Cell science or nature paper. It's at the, that's what they're all aiming for. And the Nuffield Bioethics, the Nuffield Council on Bioethics uh, last year published a report on the work it had done in the, the previous year on looking at the culture of research integrity. What is affecting um, early career researchers or senior people as well um, in research? Tempted or under pressure to compromise on research integrity and standards, 26%. Aware of others feeling like this, 58% and a higher proportion of younger people were feeling these uh, pressures. And one of the reasons that they give was pressure to, pressure to publish. And I think that also comes up in, in David's um, study as well, that the, in Auntie's study that they just published. One of the main things was the change in the pressure to publish. Reproducibility, a really big issue. Now, if people aren't aware of the issues, I wasn't here yesterday, but I saw on Twitter that, it, that there was a, um, a talk on it. Go and read this report because it very succinctly and clearly lays out the issues because it's not a black and white issue. Certain solutions are suitable for certain disciplines and you have to know what is right. There are certain disciplines where it's unusual that there is reproducibility. You know, it's very hard sometimes to achieve that and you have to recognize that. So we have to be aware it's a very mixed culture, but it is a very worrying uh, issue and there are solutions suggested in this report which came out uh, just a month ago. 50,000 US dollars, that's a large amount of money. Now, a lot of people do not realize that there are researchers in China, pre predominantly, who are paid this amount of money to get one paper published in a high impact factor journal. This will be for one of the highest ones, like the cancer research journals, but for a cell science or nature paper, we're talking 30,000 US dollars. And it depends sometimes on author position. So it could be the first author or the last author. So you've got competition for authorship places. Is this healthy? Is it going to change things? Do we have a level playing field? I'm throwing out things to you, things for discussion as well, you know, to put these in your mind, because I know that the audience is from a very varied um, background. So some of these things may be new to some people, but I hope you'll go away and look at some of these things or discuss them in your own um, companies, your own journals, your own societies. Why should we worry that there is research misconduct? That work goes on being cited and other people base their work on it. And we know that even work that is, people know should be retracted um, isn't always done. So people are doing, using that work in good faith and carrying on their projects. So it's an enormous waste of human effort, research money, institutional money. But really importantly, it's damaging public trust. Because there are People, uh, it's appearing in the mainstream media. That they make very juicy stories, juicy headlines, and these are just some of um, the things. Uh, oh, I don't think there's a pointer on this. No. No. The top one, um, rogue scientists faked AIDS research that 
funded with $19 million in taxpayer money. A member of the public reading that will be absolutely shocked. And this is a researcher who has now gone to prison. If previously, researchers have been relatively immune, but why should they not be prosecuted and be imprisoned if they do things in the outside world you would, would happen? And that, that researchers' institution have had to pay back about $7 million in research funding. The bottom one, cancer study patients made up. John Sudbo, Norwegian dental oncologist, he, very prestigious, papers published in the highest uh, impact factor journals based on totally fraudulent made-up studies. He made up 900 subjects. And I, I can go into that story if anyone wants to later and how it was found out. But people get sloppy. When they looked at the raw data, the story goes, I've seen reported, that he gave a quarter of his subjects that he made up the same birthday. He probably got tired fabricating. <laughs> I don't know. But there is often sloppiness at the bottom of these kind of things. Retraction Watch now have a leaderboard of retractions. Look at the top two. These are enormous numbers. Can you read them? Uh, 183 for Fuji, Jochen Bolt, uh, 94. Their whole body of work virtually. Everyone in their groups is affected. It's not just them. You don't, these people don't work in isolation, but they often control the data. Junior people have very little power in these things. And when I've been giving workshops, I have had people come to me distressed because their supervisor is making them do something that they shouldn't do. They know that something is wrong. And so they're carrying the burden themselves. And I've dealt with a lot of cases. I've seen a lot of reports. And behind every case, there is always the personal story. What is the story? And it's often not what it appears on the surface. I've seen cases that look like it's misconduct. People want to act dramatically, and you think, hang on, let's find out what happened. Often it's lack of knowledge, sloppiness, carelessness. There are people who do commit misconduct. But last year, and most of you will probably have seen the, um, the pictures of the researchers involved in the stap cell story, stimulus triggered acquisition of pluripotency, where the day after they were published in Nature, those papers were being criticized on pub peer, and there were problems with the images. The first author was found guilty of misconduct. The senior author was not, was exonerated, but felt deeply shamed. So in August of 2014, the same year this incident happened, people walked into the institution in Japan, the Reichen and they found him hanging from the stairwell. Th these are tragedies. These are real tragedies. Could this have been avoided? But we have to bear in mind, these are the possible consequences of the things we're dealing with. So what sorts of problems are we seeing? Now, I was on COPE Council uh, for three, three years, and Chris is here from COPE, who is now deputy. Um, Deputy Chair, I think, of, of COPE will be able to update you on anything this afternoon. Incredibly valuable resources, the cases. These are cases that editors are bringing to COPE to ask for advice. They're dealt with anonymously. There were 500 in, in the database where, when I was at COPE, and we realized that the cases were, cases were becoming far more complicated, involving lots of issues. The existing taxonomy did not cover. We couldn't tag them all appropriately. So we had created a new taxonomy, 18 major classifications, 100 keywords so we could drill down, and re-tagged all the 500 cases. So these cases provide a window on what is happening at research level at the present time. Because those are the cases that editors, journals, are dealing with and the papers being submitted. And I should say, these cases are tagged because the item was discussed, not that misconduct had occurred. So I'm going to show you an analysis. Um, these are the top eight, top nine categories in the, in the, out of the 18 major classifications divided into four-year categories. Now, authorship and plagiarism have been big issues and remain big issues. And if any of you have had authorship cases, you'll know um, that, that this is so, and they can take a lot of, lot of time. But it's the three on the right, the four on the right-hand side that have become uh, common and prob problematical. Correction of the literature. Because I tagged the cases, I know that this occurs so frequently because editors journals know something has to be done, but they don't know what to, needs to be done to correct the literature. Should it be a retraction, a correction, expression of concern? There's a lot of confusion about that. Data, really big issue. And when we drill down into the keywords, the two major issues in data are unauthorized use and images. Peer review, another big category. And I'm going to just very briefly go through, through those, those categories. We could spend you know, an hour talking about each of these. 
authorship. Editors have to deal with these all the time. Um, the, but the work has to be put on hold. The manuscript, whichever stage of the process, it is put on hold. It can be devastating for a, a research group because the whole, whole research group suffers. We're seeing increasing numbers of authors as well as um, interdisciplinary collaborations. The rules are different. And in May this year, the record was broken for the largest number of authors on a paper. There are now, four, uh, there are now papers with more than 5,000 authors on. Who did what? Who's accountable? How do you resolve these issues? But again, everyone here can help because provide the guidelines. Don't just refer to, like, to the ICMJE because they're not appropriate for every discipline. Do it creatively with the researchers in your discipline and saying, what are the issues? Because if you present something that is medical, especially to arts people, they'll say, it does not apply to me. Some arts people just say research integrity problems do not apply to me, especially with more senior people. And this is just not so. And Chris, I'm sure, will reinforce that at COPE, we see cases from editors of all dis disciplines. So who did what? But there are new areas. And these are the kind of things that I'm absolutely shocked at. Just for interest, who has read this paper that appeared in Science? China's publication, Bizarre. A few people. All go away and read this paper, because it will shock you. This was an investigation carried out by science for five months um, in, in China. There are papers appearing in high-quality journals where the authorship has been up for sale during provisional accept stage. The paper's been provisionally accepted. Brokers then go out and sell additional authorship places. And then the, the re investigators looked at those papers and they did appear because they pretended to be people interested in buying authorship. And then they saw those papers appear in these quite prestigious journals with fake authors, with, with, well, with real people on, but these people had done nothing. If there's one thing you do on authorship within your organizations, make sure that everybody, everyone in every one of your journals, if there is a request from authors during the review process, during the proof stage, at any stage after submission for addition of more authors or for people being, being taken off, but that's a, a separate issue. Why? Why are these people being added? I know from experience at my journal when I used to do this, half the queries would go away. It's not up to editors to, to arbitrate in authorship but suit, but this is a legitimate this question. What has this person actually done? Why are they being added at this late stage? But as I say, very, very shocking. And it's not just authorship. You'll see some of the headlines in this paper. You don't even have to have done the experiments. You can buy the data. You can have it made up, or you can buy it from institutions that are providing data for people who want to be authors. And they're using phrases like, don't worry about not having done the work. It's not important. So go, go and read the paper. Plagiarism, very, very big issue. Cross-check, very valuable tool. We're using it. But does everyone know how to use it appropriately? It's not a plagiarism detection uh, system. It detects textual duplication, not even figures. And a person needs to then go in and interpret it. And is it plagiarism? And now, especially with preprint servers, and especially bioarchive, which people said preprint servers would never work in biology, the life sciences, it is working. You can have a paper appear with 50, 80, 90% similarity that is submitted to a journal. If the editorial assistants, the people on the ground, do not know that the policy of that journal is we do accept preprint uh, articles that have been on preprint servers, they send a letter off to the author, and I've seen examples of this, sorry, you've committed plagiarism. Totally wrong sort of letter to write in the first place, but they haven't. Again, go away, get your, or your editors, your, your journal publishing managers to discuss at editorial board level of every journal what will they, what is their policy what, how will they act in cases of preprint, things that have been on preprint servers and what is considered prior publication? And here there's an example. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Retraction Watch featured um, an engineering paper. The editor rejected it. It had been in a conference proceedings. One of the most common questions I get from people, can I publish in conference proceedings? What will it impact my possibilities of publishing in a paper? This paper was 50% changed. It had five extra, figure, five, five extra um, figures. When they took a poll, because the editor did retract it, the poll of the people on Retraction Watch most said it shouldn't have been retracted. But researchers are beholden to editors, but editors are mostly not trained. But they have power over researchers, their promotion prospects, their grant proposal uh, prospects. Editors need to be trained in this and create an awareness. A lot of people aren't aware of what preprint servers are. 
educate them, tell them what preprint servers are and why it is way, the way the world is actually uh, moving in many disciplines. Image manipulation. I don't have time to go into this, but there are various basic rules. Some journals are doing image checking. These are very resource heavy things. Now, some of your journals will be doing, doing it. You have to have the technical expertise, you have to have the time. And there are journals that are devote people time to this. The Journal of Cell Biology has had a dedicated person for many years. All the EMBO journals do. And you, you can go and read their articles. And both of those and other journals find that you get about 20% of the figures in accepted papers have to be remade before they can be published. They're actually not adequate at that time for various reasons. 1%, the decision has to be reversed. 10 minutes. Oh, 10, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Um, does anyone refer or you may not know, um, uh, 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 your level, but just in, out of interest, to the seminal paper, What's in a Picture? The Temptation of Image Manipulation at the Journal of Cell Biology. Go and read this paper. It varies, that not a hand went up then. This is a paper that I even recommend arts people to go and read because it very simply describes what you can do. Not all the technical stuff, which most people who don't know how to use Photoshop we have a generation of people who coming up, young people who know how to use Photoshop, senior researchers, and this is a very generalized statement, so forgive me anyone who, who, does, who, doesn't know, who don't know, they're not looking at the raw data, they're looking at the images that can be beautified sometimes because researchers tend to think editors want images that are as beautiful as possible, and I say the absolute opposite is true. They want messy picture data, data are messy, and we all know that the worst thing a reviewer, an editor can say to a researcher, the data look too good to be true. But in this case, and this shows you, because you use, journals use Photoshop to find out where the image manipulation has been used inappropriately. It doesn't matter what this image is, it's sort of cells down a microscope. The top is what it looks like, the bottom, you can see it's a jigsaw puzzle. This is not a record of research. And what I try to tell research is, research and reporting is about reporting what you did and found, not what you would like to have found or what would, finding would get you your next research grant. And what the tragedy of this is, that uh, what was cut out of this image, when people look back in the future when new discoveries are made, could there have been something important there? And what I try and teach people is, not, we're not going through checklists, oh, I've ticked that box, oh, I'm ethically correct. Change how people think, the questions they ask, the way they act. It becomes hard in an environment where people see other people acting differently. Data, unauthorized use. This week there's been a case in uh, retraction on Retraction Watch where a paper has been retracted because someone wasn't authorized to produce the data. Very good guidelines from the World Conferences on Research Integrity have, um, have, have come out. Link to those again because they give researchers very, very clear guidance. And this was on um, collaborative research. Um, I'm going to go into the end. Personal communications. Do you allow them in your papers? What if someone hasn't got permission from the person that they're citing? We always used to require a letter of permission from the person that the personal communication information was coming from. You might jeopardize their IP. Um, all kinds of other issues. Data security, Data Protection Act um, requirements. And the fake reviewer cases. And I'm not going to go into this because I think we've all heard of this. Because I was shocked in 2012 when this happened, and this was the first time I'd really been shocked in, in, you know, in the modern era, in my 30, 35 years. And I thought, how could this happen, where someone, journals are sending reviews to people who have been made up? And it's happened across journals, across continents. Um, it's not an isolated uh, phenomenon. And when they asked this researcher who'd been guilty of creating false accounts for falsely named people, and the authors effectively, for anyone who doesn't know, reviewed their own manuscripts, can be mistaken for fake reviews, but he said he wasn't only his mistake, the editors invited those reviews without confirming the identity of the reviewers. This is bread and butter stuff of the editorial office. The kind of checks that you do were not done in these cases. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and uh, in the discussion, I might be able to hinge on it. So COPE produced COPE ethical guidelines for peer reviewers, which I have a hard copy here. Who links through to these? Because these provide, does anyone here? Go and, very few hands, a couple of hands. Go and have a look, because they provide guidance to researchers on the ethical requirements of peer review, because most are not trained in peer review. And this is where the ORCID ID is, is coming into effect, because 
you have to be able to verify the identity of the people who are your authors and reviewers. People are incorporating them into their um, uh, workflows. I use mine all the time. I've got it in my footer. I encourage people to do it. Most people, even if they have one, don't know what to do with it. I do, that's another question I, I, I ask people. So again, it's getting it into use that is, is a challenge. Now, since that time, more cases of authors submitting fake reviews, editors creating fake reviewers, third parties suggesting fake reviewers, and there are now about 260 retractions due to that. In my mind, this is, and I've expressed it graphically here, the pyramid of research integrity. We've got global guidelines. These then filter down into national guidelines, institutions, re research group leaders, and at the bottom, the individual researchers. But these guidelines, these, these worthy statements, have to be interpreted each, at each level and suitable for each discipline. Funders, journals, all of you, learned publish, societies, publishers, can all impact this and have an enormously positive uh, effect on this by the guidelines you, you create. Global level, the World Conferences on Research Integrity, of which there have been four, and the guidelines have come out from this. The Singapore Statement on Research Integrity and then um, the uh, Montreal Statement on Cross-Boundary Research Collaborations linked to these things. They make it very easy because they're very simple, concise for researchers to understand, but to ask the questions, what can I do with my data? What questions do I need to ask? I need to ask them at the start of research projects. Nations, at national level, China. China is taking steps. And again, you can go and read these papers. Um, it was reported just last month. There are investigations, people are being reprimanded, action is being taken. Um, the white paper, um, the turning point from Springer, Nature, emphasizes lack of education. I think the most important thing is the lack of education. Many times students don't even realize that they're due to something unethical or legitimate. For instance, I had a student in my lab, he used the same graphs and text from a submitted article in another article, he didn't know that this is not allowed. Self-plagiarism. Reusing, recycling, very, very big issue. There is a lot of confusion about, and that needs uh, clarification at each journal level. Four, Recom minutes. Four minutes, thank you. In the UK, the Concordat to Support Research Integrity, has anyone aware of this? Produced by the research councils and the governments. Even universities aren't, even uh, at lower levels, at department level, because they are supposed to comply with it. It doesn't tell them what to do. It's intentionally not prescriptive because institutional funding is becoming, compli compliance with this is becoming a requirement for institutional funding. <clears throat> Institutions are wondering what to do because they want to do something and it has to be scalable. And so for three years I have been, like Glasgow University, I did the whole intake of new postgraduate students last year in the same workshops. I'm not sc scalable, so when Dundee University approached me to do a video series on research integrity, I had been working on the past year, it became a much bigger project than we anticipated. So we have a video series, three hours long in total, that covers the whole of research integrity that every PhD student will have to take and pass the multiple choice quiz before they can go on to the second year. And there are case studies, because case studies, discussions are absolutely valuable if you can get people talking about it and with notes from moderators. So as I said, this was a big project, so this is how one university has approached it. Ethics discussions in groups, I try and encourage this. And if anyone does, does anyone look at the Dynamic Ecology blog? Go and have a look at it. It's a superb blog. They talk about all kinds. You don't have to be an ecologist. They do talk about ecology, but the majority is about other issues to do with publishing, grants, early career researchers. And one of the guys who runs these once had a scientific ethics discussion. And I know this is really unusual, but instead of having a journal club meeting, why not talk about these issues? And I advise junior people, if they have a problem in their groups on authorship or something, suggest that their group has something, because they can very naively say, I've heard a workshop, I'd quite like to be able to talk about authorship, because I think it's changing, get the papers together. Give, gives power to, to junior people. And you can read the comments there, how positive they were. What can you do? Provide guidance, clear and concise. Get your editorial boards talking about things. And I know it's not discussed at editorial board meetings, and if it is, Policy doesn't come out and it isn't put on the website and it isn't told to the researchers. So make sure that they keep up to date. What are your mechanisms for keeping up to date? Are you three years behind? Everything is moving so quickly, you have to have your finger on the pulse and almost be ahead of the curve so that you can provide the materials that researchers that come to your journal and they will come back because it's problem free. You have given them that little bit of piece of advice that will make it straightforward. Filter information from the bottom up. Maybe your editorial assistants 
are, are on the ground, have their ears to the ground. They know what's happening, but they maybe don't know how to interpret it in the bigger picture. Reporting guidelines, absolutely important, but it's no point just having them. As we know with the ARRIVE guidelines on animal research, you have to have a pen effective implementation. Go and look on the Equator site. I think there are now over 200 guidelines there, appropriate for different disciplines. And don't assume even the most basic knowledge, like can someone submit something to the same job at the same time. Some of the new ventures, and we all know there are new players, some of them who are tremendous coming into scholarly publishing, some of those who are not. They are born digital. They have some of them fantastic information. Go and look at some of those new people. Go and look at some of your journals and you will see confusion, things added on by production, two pages on formatting of a paper. Get the important stuff up front. And um, if go away and discuss something that is a big issue waiting to explode, what can be done with peer reviews? Because now there are organizations that are posting reviews. Getting reviewer credit, reviewers should get credit. I'm totally supportive of that. I've spent a lot of my life you know, working out systems to try and do this. What can you do with them? Because researchers are seeing these sites, they're posting reviews, not realizing this should be confidential. Does the journal know? Does the author do? So go and discuss, and you'll see Cope had a discussion, and so did the scholarly uh, kitchen. D very many comments on those, which will give you perspective. Discuss at editorial board level, then make it clear. So that's a very rapid tour around the kind of research integrity issues for today. Thank you. <laughs>